in the country, between the mountain and the walls and beyond them, many people looking idiotic are wandering in the still dim light. They howl, weep and lament. Some say, his blood has rained fire. Some exclaim, Jehovah has appeared in the midst of the lightning to curse the temple. Some moan, the sepulchres, the sepulchres. Joseph gets hold of a man who is striking his head against the walls and calls him by his name, dragging him as he enters the town. Simon, what are you saying? Leave me, you are dead too, all dead, all outside, and they curse me. He's gone mad, says Nicodemus. They leave him and they hasten towards the praetorium. The town is a prey to terror. People roam, beating their breasts. People who jump backwards or turn round frightened upon hearing a voice or steps behind them. In one of the many dark ultravolts, the apparition of Nicodemus dressed in white wool, because in order to be quicker, he's taken off his dark mantle on Golgotha, causes a fleeing Pharisee to utter a cry of terror. He then realises that it is Nicodemus, and he clings to his neck with a strange effusion, shouting, Don't curse me! My mother appeared to me and said, Be cursed forever! And then he collapses on the ground, moaning, I'm afraid! I'm afraid! They're all mad! say the two men. They arrive at the Praetorium and it is only here, while waiting to be received by the proconsul, that Joseph and Nicodemus understand the reason for so much terror. Many sepulchres had been opened by the earthquake and there were people who swore that they had seen skeletons come out of them and that for a moment they resumed human appearance and were going about accusing and cursing those who were guilty of the deicide in the Gospels, particularly St. Matthew's Gospel. We have the death of Jesus on the cross and then various events which are described as happening and they seem quite fantastical. I'll read them from Matthew's Gospel from the point where Jesus dies. Matthew chapter 27 verse 50, verse 50. Then Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And all at once the veil of the temple was torn this way and that from the top to the bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks parted asunder and the graves were opened and many bodies arose out of them. Bodies of holy men gone to their rest who after his rising again left their graves and went into the holy city, where they were seen by many. This seems just too much. It's very unnatural. And so there's a tendency to say, well, this is Matthew, um, just laying it on a bit thick with the mythology. But as Catholics, we should believe this actually happened, just as St. Matthew describes it. Why would he describe it something that didn't actually happen? But nonetheless, it does seem very strange and very fantastical. So I'm going to read what I regard as the historical account, which bears out the truth of St. Matthew's account from the vision given by the Lord Jesus himself to Maria Valtorta of this event. I will start just before the Lord Jesus dies Marie Valtorta's description of the crucifixion is extremely detailed, as you might imagine, and the um, suffering of Jesus we see goes on for a very long time. And she describes the movements of his body and so on. So I shall start where we get one of Jesus's last words. So at least we'll have some context here. This is from volume five of the poem of the man God, the hardback. English 1986 edition. There is silence again. Then the supplication pronounced with infinite kindness, with fervent prayer. Father, into your hands 
I commit my spirit. Further silence. Also, the death rattle becomes fainter. It is just a breath confined to his lips and throat. Then, there is the last spasm of Jesus. A dreadful convulsion that seems to tear the body with the three nails from the cross rises three times from the feet to the head through all the poor tortured nerves. It heaves the abdomen three times in an abnormal way, then leaves it after dilating it as if it were upsetting the viscera and it drops and becomes hollow as if it were empty. It heaves, swells and contracts the thorax so violently that the skin sinks between the ribs which stretch appearing under the skin and reopening the wounds of the scourges. It makes the head fall back violently once, twice, three times, hitting the wood hard. It contracts all the muscles of the face in a spasm, accentuating the deviation of the mouth to the right. It open wides, opens wide and dilates the eyelids, under which one can see the eyeballs roll and the sclerotic appear. The body is all bent. In the last of the three contractions, it is a drawn arch, which vibrates and is dreadful to look at. And then a powerful cry, unimaginable in that exhausted body, bursts forth, rending the air. The loud cry mentioned by the Gospels and is the first part of the word mother and nothing else. His head falls on his chest. His body leans forward. The trembling stops. He breathes no more. He has breathed his last. The earth replies to the cry of the murdered innocent with a frightening rumble. From a thousand bugle horn giants seem to give out only one sound and on that terrible chord there are the isolated rending notes of lightning that streaks the sky in all directions falling on the town on the temple on the crowd I think that some people were struck by lightning because the crowd was struck directly the lightning is the only irregular light that enables one to see at intervals and immediately afterwards, while a volley of thunderbolts still continues, the earth is shaken by a cyclonic whirlwind. The earthquake and the tornado join together to give an apocalyptic punishment to the blasphemers. The summit of Golgotha trembles and quakes like a plate in the hands of a madman because of the subsultory and undulatory shocks that shake the three crosses so violently that they seem on the point of being overturned. Longinus, John, the soldiers grab whatever they can, as best they can, not to fall. But John, while grasping the cross with one arm, with the other supports Mary, who, both because of her grief and the unsteadiness, has leaned on his chest. The other soldiers, and in particular those on the side sloping downhill, have had to take shelter in the centre to avoid being thrown down the precipice. The robbers howl with terror. The crowd howls even more and would like to run away, but it is not possible. People fall one on top of the other they tread on one another. They fall into the fissures of the ground. They hurt themselves. They roll down the slope as if they'd gone mad. The earthquake and the tornado recur three times. Then there is the absolute immobility of a dead world. Only flashes of lightning without the rumble of thunder still streak the sky 
illuminating the scene of the Jews fleeing in every direction, at their wit's end, their hands stretched forward or raised to the sky, at which they had so far sneered, and of which they are now afraid. Darkness is mitigated by a dim light, which, increased by the silent magnetic lightning, enables one to see that many are lying on the ground. I do not know whether they are dead or have fainted. A house is on fire inside the walls and the flames rise up straight in the still air, a bright red spot in the grey green atmosphere. Mary raises her head from John's chest and looks at her Jesus. She calls him as she cannot see him well in the dim light and her poor eyes are full of tears. She calls him three times, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It is the first time that she calls him by his name since she has been on Calvary. Then, as a flash forms a kind of crown over the top of Golgotha, she sees him motionless, all bent forward, with his head hanging so much forward and to the right that his cheek touches his shoulder and his chin rests on his ribs. And she understands. She stretches out her hands in the dark air and shouts, my son, my son, my son. She then listens. Also, her mouth is open. She seems to be wanting to hear also with it, as her eyes are wide open to see. She cannot believe that her Jesus is no longer. John, who has also looked and heard, and has understood that everything is over, embraces Mary and tries to take her away, saying, he no longer suffers. But before the apostle finishes his sentence, Mary, who has understood, frees herself. She turns round, she bends towards the ground, she covers her eyes with her hands and shouts, I no longer have my son. She then staggers and would fall if John did not hold her against his heart. And he then sits down on the ground to sustain her on his chest more easily until the Marys, no longer held back by the upper circle of armed soldiers, because since the Jews have run away, the Roman soldiers have gathered in the open space below, commenting on the event, replace the apostle near the mother. The Magdalene sits where John was, and she almost lays Mary on her knees, holding her between her arms and her breast, kissing her deadly pale face, which is reclined on her compassionate shoulder. Martha and Susanna, with a sponge and a linen cloth soaked in vinegar, moisten her temples and nostrils, while her sister-in-law Mary kisses her hands, calling her in a heart-rending voice. And as soon as Mary opens her eyes again and casts a glance that her grief makes, so to say, dull, she says to her, Daughter, my beloved daughter, listen, tell me that you see me. I'm your Mary. Don't look at me so. And as the first sob opens Mary's throat and her first tears begin to fall, the good Mary of Alphaeus says, Yes, weep, hear with me, as if you were near a mother, my poor holy daughter. And when she hears her say, Oh Mary, Mary, have you seen? She moans, Yes, I have, but, but, daughter, Oh, daughter. And the elderly Mary can find no other word and weeps. She weeps disconsolately, echoed by all the other women, that is, Martha and Mary, John's mother, 
and Susanna. The other pious women are no longer there. I think that they've gone away and the shepherds with them when that feminine cry was heard. The soldiers are speaking in low voices to one another. Have you noticed the Judeans? They were afraid now and they were beating their breasts. The priests were the most terrorized. What a fright. I've seen other earthquakes, but never like this one. Look, the ground is full of fissures. And a whole stretch of the long way has slid down over there. And there are the bodies under it. Leave them, so many snakes less. Oh, another fire in the country. But is he really dead? Can't you see? Do you doubt it? Joseph and Nicodemus appear from behind the rock. They had certainly taken shelter there, behind the protection of the mountain, to save themselves from the thunderbolts. They go to Longinus. We want the corpse. Only the proconsul can grant it. Go quick, because I heard that the Judeans want to go to the Praetorium to obtain permission to fracture his legs. I would not like them to disfigure his body. How do you know? A report of the ensign. Go, I will wait. The two men rush down the steep road and disappear. It is at this moment that Longinus approaches John and in a low voice says something to him which I do not understand. Then he makes a soldier give him a lance. He looks at the women who are all attending to Mary, who is slowly recovering her strength. They have all their backs turned to the cross. Longinus places himself in front of the crucified. He ponders carefully how to deal the blow and he strikes it. The lance penetrates deeply from the bottom upwards, from right to left. John, wavering between the desire to see and the horror of seeing, makes a wry face for a moment. It is done, my friend, says Longinus, and he ends, better so, as for a knight and without fracturing bones, he was really a just man. A lot of water and just a trickle of blood already tending to clot drip from the wound. I say drip. They only come out trickling from the neat cut that remains motionless. Whereas had there been any breathing, it would have opened and closed with the movements of the thorax and abdomen. While on Calvary, everything remains in this tragic situation. I join Joseph and Nicodemus, who are going along, down, a shortcut to gain time. They are almost at the bottom when they meet Gamaliel. I'll just pause for a moment there. Gamaliel is somebody you will know very little of. Jewish people may know more than us Christians because Gamaliel was a great sage for them. This is the Gamaliel of the first century AD. Um, what they actually know, I, I don't know, and I doubt they can know very much on an historical basis because um, very little will have come down to them except through the Talmud, which was compiled centuries after Gamaliel died. But nonetheless, they know of Gamaliel and his great fame as perhaps Israel's greatest rabbi of that time. We, the Christians, only know Gamaliel from one instance, that's in the Acts of the Apostles, when he speaks to the Sanhedrin about how they basically should ease off their persecution of the apostles because appealing to their reason, and we know it's more than that if we read 
Marie Valtorta's writings, but he's appealing to their reason and he makes it seem as if it's just a question of reasoning. He's saying, look, if this is not from God, it will wither away. If it is from God, you can't stop it no matter what you do. And they, he seems to make some headway with them on that. So I'll just, but in Murray of Altorta's writings, we get a huge amount of information about Pe Gamaliel. Gamaliel, the person, um, as well as his status, he is austere, he is patrician, he is absolutely self-assured, and he has a great following. He's a just man, but he's not one to accept Jesus as the Messiah. I've said in another video that in a converse, in, in discussions um, with, with other rabbis on another occasion, he says, I saw somebody, want. in fact, it might be a conversation he has with, with the adult Jesus, saying that he saw a young boy once in the temple and he thought, this is the Messiah. But then that boy disappeared and he was never seen again. And he's also aware of the prophecy about the Messiah being born 30 years prior to Jesus, the adult Jesus appearing uh, in Israel. And that, that appearance, though, was also the time when Herod slaughtered the innocents. So either the Messiah was killed 30 years prior to Jesus, or Jesus is not that boy that appears and then disappears in the temple. And we know who prayed the rosary that the finding of the child Jesus in the temple. And those who read St. Luke's Gospel, that's the event, by the way, that, that Gamaliel is referring to. This Gamaliel, fascinating character. As I say, self-assured, doesn't doubt himself. And he, ins he insists that he must have a sign before he'll consider Jesus as the Messiah. And Jesus respects him, appeals to him, not in an overt way, but covertly. But he tells Gamaliel, you will have the sign, you will have it. And he tries to get across to him that he shouldn't wait for the sign. But Gamaliel is not. He doesn't pay attention until really it's too late. And we're at that point now. We've already, I've already recounted the um, earthquake, lightning, fire going into the town of Jerusalem and burning at least one building there and another in the country, the Roman soldier says. So let's now continue where Gamaliel suddenly appeared in the account. Joseph and Arimathea and Nicodemus are on the way to the proconsul, Pontius Pilate, to get the right to take the corpse of Jesus from the, from the cross. They are almost at the bottom when they meet Gamaliel, an unkempt Gamaliel, with no headgear, no mantle, with his magnificent garment soiled with mould and torn by bramble. A Gamaliel who is running, climbing and panting, with his hands in his thin, very grizzled hair of an elderly man. They speak to one another without stopping. Gamaliel? You? You, Joseph? Are you leaving him? No, I am not. But how come you are here, and in that state? Dreadful things. I was in the temple. The sign. The temple door unhinged. The purple hyacinth veil is hanging, torn. The Holy of Holies is open. There is anathema upon us. He has spoken while running towards the summit, driven mad by the test. The two men look at him go. They look at each other. They say together, these stones will shudder at my last words. He had promised him. They hasten their pace towards the town. In the country, between the mountain and the walls and beyond them, Many people looking idiotic are wandering in the still dim light. They howl, weep and lament. Some say, his blood has rained fire. Some exclaim, 
Jehovah has appeared in the midst of the lightning to curse the temple. Some moan. The sepulchres, the sepulchres. Joseph gets hold of a man who is striking his head against the walls and calls him by his name, dragging him as he enters the town. Simon, what are you saying? Leave me, you are dead too, all dead, all outside, and they curse me. He's gone mad, says Nicodemus. They leave him and they hasten towards the Praetorium. The town is a prey to terror. People roam, beating their breasts. People who jump backwards or turn round frightened upon hearing a voice or steps behind them. In one of the many dark ultravolts, the apparition of Nicodemus dressed in white wool, because in order to be quicker, he's taken off his dark mantle on Golgotha, causes a fleeing Pharisee to utter a cry of terror. He then realises that it is Nicodemus and he clings to his neck with a strange effusion, shouting, Don't curse me! My mother appeared to me and said, Be cursed forever! And then he collapses on the ground, moaning, I'm afraid! I'm afraid! They're all mad! say the two men. They arrive at the Praetorium and it is only here, while waiting to be received by the proconsul, that Joseph and Nicodemus understand the reason for so much terror. Many sepulchres had been opened by the earthquake and there were people who swore that they had seen skeletons come out of them and that for a moment they resumed human appearance and were going about accusing and cursing those who were guilty of the deicide. I leave them in the entrance hall of the Praetorium, which Jesus' two friends enter without so many stupid horrors and fears of contamination. And I go back to Calvary, joining Gamaliel, who by now exhausted is climbing the last few meters. He is proceeding, striking his breast, and when he arrives at the first of the two open spaces, he throws himself on the ground, face downwards, a long white form on the yellowish ground, and he says, moaning, the sign, the sign, tell me that you forgive me. A whisper, even only a whisper, to tell me that you hear me and forgive me. I understand that he thinks that Jesus is still alive and he changes his mind only when a soldier pushing him with his lance says, get up and be silent. It's of no use. You should have thought of that previously. He is dead and I, a heathen, I'm telling you, this man, whom you have crucified, was really the Son of God. Dead? Are you dead? Oh, Gamaliel raises his terrorised face. He tries to see as far up as the top to, in the twilight. He cannot see much, but he can see enough to realise that Jesus is dead. And he sees the compassionate group that is consoling Mary and John standing on the left side of the cross and weeping and Longinus standing straight on the right side, solemn in his respectful posture. He kneels down, stretches out his arms and weeping says, it was you, it was you. We can no longer be forgiven. We have asked your blood upon us and it cries to heaven, and heaven curses us. Oh, but you were mercy. I say to you, I, the destroyed rabbi of Judah, your blood on us for pity's sake. Sprinkle us with it, because only your blood can impetrate forgiveness for us. And he weeps. And then, in a lower voice, he confesses his torture. I have the requested sign. 
but ages and ages of spiritual blindness are upon my interior sight. And against my present will rises the voice of my proud thought of the past. Have mercy on me, light of the world. Let one of your rays descend on the darkness that did not understand you. I am the old Judean faithful to what I thought was justice, and it was error. I am now a barren land, no longer with any of the ancient trees of the ancient faith, without any seed or stalk of the new faith. I am an arid desert. Work the miracle of making a flower that has your name spring up in this poor heart of an old, obstinate Israelite. Since you are the liberator, come into my poor thought, which is a prisoner of formulas. Isaiah says so. He paid for sinners and took upon himself the sins of many. Oh, also mine, Jesus Nazarene. He stands up. He looks at the cross, which is becoming neater and neater in the light that is clearing up. And then he goes away, stooping, aged, destroyed. <laughs>